So I really like to talk about a, a very old problem that I've been struggling with for many, many years. Uh, namely, how do you get a stack trace in Haskell? And uh, just like over a, slightly over a year ago, I had a click in the works. <laughs> So, slightly over a year ago, I had a breakthrough in this point. And, uh, and I was all excited and I posted on a social network as we do when we have such breakthroughs. And um, this must be the most popular sentence that I've ever written. <laughs> 230 people clicked the, the plus one button. Sadly, it turned out to be wrong. <laughs> The last time I gave this talk, somebody in the audience went back afterwards and removed their plus one from the plus <laughs> <laughs> And that was 229. So, so, a bit of background. Why, why are we so excited about stack traces? Well, it's, it's a great abstraction of what's going on when you're running a program. So you see the complete chain of function calls right from the top of the program right down to where you are. So you can tell, very, uh, you can tell a lot about how you got there. And furthermore, it, it's often very easy to get the stack trace because it's, it's created as a side effect of the program's execution. It's the execution stack that the program is running under, in an imperative language at least. But it's not really the case at Haskell for a couple of reasons. So, one is that we do something called tail call optimization. The tail call optimization is if you're making a function call and it's the last thing in a function, then uh, we remove the call as stack from the stack frame and just make the, make the new call. Um, so that loses some information. For example, you have a program like this, where main calls f here, passing argument, and f is a function that calls g, and g here is a tail call, and inside g we happen to do a divide by zero, so we'd really like to know where we are when we make that divide by zero. Uh, the stack we would probably see if we were to look at the execution stack would be something like this. We'd see the main called g. We've completely lost the information about the fact that f was called in between. In a simple program, we can tell, but in a larger program, if you were to throw away half the information, you'd get less confused. Another problem that gives rise to very strange looking stacks is lazy evaluation. So, here's another example. If we print uh, the head of the call of f applied to x, and f is a function that maps g over a list, and one of those calls to g in, this, in the result of map is going to divide by zero. We might like to know that main called f and f called map and map called g and g is a thing divided by zero, but in fact we see that main called print and print called g because g was a suspended computation returned by the call to f and it ended up being forced by the call to print. Right, so we've lost some information there. And um, this is not the only strange thing that can happen with lazy evaluation the stuff that's general around all over the place. So um, there's something else that we need to take into account is that we really like that uh, the, the transformations that GHC does inside this optimizer really mangles the program around a lot and we'd like to have some idea of what we mean by the semantics of stacks so that we can be sure that when GHC does its transformations it doesn't change the kind of stacks that you see. Right. Um, and furthermore, something that I've discovered is even if you fix these problems, one to three, there's another problem that crops up, which I'll describe shortly. We really need a framework for thinking about the issues so that we can understand the problems and try and find the solutions. So the framework that I'm going to use is a language construct, which I'll call push. So push takes a label and an expression. And the intuitive meaning of push is that it just pushes the label out on the code stack while evaluating E. Okay, the precise semantics we'll talk about in a minute. It's a construct of the source language, so you can imagine writing this in the program. 
In fact, GHC has something very like this that we, uh, we've called the Pragma SCC. So SCC gets translated internally into push inside GHC. Um, and you can imagine either you can write these in the source program or that the compiler could add them itself. And if the compiler adds them itself, then it can choose how detailed it wants to be. You could imagine adding push just to exported functions or to top level functions or to all the sub expressions. There are, there's a wide variety of different strategies that you might use depending on the kind of things that you want to do. All functions is good for profiling, for example, but uh, for debugging call sites is a good thing to, to annotate. Right, so now this explains how we annotate the program with the source location information. Now, what do we do with those things? Well, uh, I'll talk about uh, stats first of all. We want an abstraction for stats. So, in, in Haskell syntax, here, so a stack is a list of labels. If you imagine the, the label at the front is the most recently pushed one. And there are two operations on stacks. So, you can push a label onto a stack and you get another stack back. And you can make a function call. So, a function call takes the stack at the call site, stack of the function, and returns the stack you should use for making the function call. So I'm not going to give you the definitions of these things because that's what it all hinges on, basically. What definition do you choose for these things? And there are various cho choices. But the semantics, independent of the definitions of push and call, are very straightforward. So this is based on a, a standard lazy evaluation semantics. I've written it out in Haskell here so you can hopefully understand it. Um, and the, the unusual things about the semantics are that we take a stack as the input. And this is the, the call stack that we're trying to maintain. And the expression to evaluate. And the evaluator will return a pair of the stack that was the stack when we finished evaluating the expression. And an expression which is actually a value. And we're in some monad. Uh, so the monad E is just a state monad containing the heap where the heap here is a mapping from variables to pairs of stacks and expressions. So in our heap, we have to maintain a stack for each of the expressions stored in the heap. And you can imagine implementing that by just attaching the stack to each of the closures in the heap. And that's what GHC does when it's profiling. So values are fairly straightforward. Just return the current stack and the value, so for lambdas. If we had a push construct, then we're going to call our function push and labels to generate the new stack after pushing L onto it. Now, let bindings. So I should mention that in this language, uh, the language is in the A normal form, so all of the arguments for applications are always variables. And if you want to allocate a closure, that's done with a let. So a let expression takes a variable and an expression to bind to a variable and the body of the let. So we just insert into our heap, so insert heap is an operation at the moment, uh, the variable and the pair of the current stack and the expression that we're binding. So this captures the current stack with the closure that we're saving in the heap. All right, application. We need to first evaluate the function. That's the left-hand side of the application. That will return a lambda, I hope if it's type correct, and a stack. And this stack is going to be the stack that we make the function call in. And to make the function call, we need to substitute, well, we have a variable here because it's an A normal form. So substitute x for the y from the lambda expression uh, in the body of the lambda expression, and then continue evaluating. So there's, there's nothing um, unusual about this semantics. It's straightforward, lazy evaluation semantics, except that we're maintaining stats as we go along. And here's the variable rule. So the variable rule is a slightly complicated. When we counter a variable, look up in the heap, and if it's one of the values, an integer or a lambda, then well, integer just uh, return the integer. If it's a lambda, this is where we make the function call. So we call our operation on stacks, where first argument is the stack of the call, which is passed in here to eval. Stack prime is the stack attached to the lambda in the heap. Right, so that's the stack that was stored along with the lambda in the heap when the closure was created and return the lambda. So if we're returning to an application, this is the stack that's going to be used by the application to make the function call. 
And if it's anything else, then this is where we're doing laziness, this is where we're doing lazy evaluation. Um, e is a non-value, so we need to go and evaluate E in the context of the stack that was stored along with the suspended computation in the heap. Um, we've got the value back, insert the value into the heap, so that we get the value next time, and then continue by evaluating the variable. Right, so now that we've got our semantics, we understand how we're managing stacks. What we have to do now is find suitable definitions of these two operations, push and call. So, uh, I just want to mention before that, that we've dealt with the problem of lazy evaluation completely by just storing the current stack in the, uh, in the heap with the suspension, and then restoring it when we go to evaluate the thumb. So that's, the problem of lazy evaluation is essentially out of the way. We don't have to worry about it anymore. And similarly, tail calls. So, um, the semantics said nothing about tail call optimization. So if your implementation is doing tail call optimization, then your stack model must not. Okay. So here's an example. And through the example, we'll try and figure out what these operations push and call should be. It's a very simple example. Name is a lambda expression. And inside the lambda, we'll push a label and then bind uh, by y to 1 and make a call to a function f passing y. And f is a lambda expression that pushes f on the stack and does an, uh, an addition. And it's the stack at this point that we're interested in. So the heap is initialized. We have to initialize our heap with all these bindings. So we'll just pick a stack. We pick a stack randomly, and the one we pick is called cat for constant applicative form. Now, when we get to this expression here, the current stack is main. So we push main on top of the empty stack. And when we make the function call, f is bound to a lambda expression, so that's already evaluated. <coughs> so now we are calling, so the operation to make the function call to construct a new stack is going to take two stacks. The stack of the call is main, and the stack of the function, because it's already evaluated, is just cap. And it seems like a sensible <coughs> stack to use for the call might be just main. So let's assume for now that uh, this call with two arguments here is returning the stack of the application. So now we evaluate under the stack main, push f y plus y, so that comes from here, and now push f on the current stack, so our current stack is main color f, and y plus y. So at the plus, the current stack is main color f, which is what we wanted. So it seems like perhaps the definition of call that we want is just call s app and f s lamb. It's just S app. And that seems like a sensible suggestion because that's exactly what you would get if you were running a strict functional language. And we, the stack of the function call is just while well, we take the current stack and just start pushing more stuff on it. So let's run with that and see where we go. It turns out that if you had written instead of the push inside the lambda uh, of the de definition of F here, if the, the push is outside the lambda, then it doesn't work so well. Because what's the stack when you make the call of f here? Well, you have to evaluate f, and f, during the evaluation of f, you push f on the calf stack, then end up with a lambda. But then we make the call in the original stack, which is just main. And now, when we're evaluating the lambda inside here, there's nothing to push on the stack anymore. So the stack will get its main. So this push f outside the lambda is just ignored, it's been lost somewhere. So the behaviour we're getting from this definition of call is that the scope of push doesn't extend inside the lambdas. So maybe you can do something to fix this. Maybe we should, in the compiler, go through and label each lambda individually. So the compiler could say, oh, I can see I'm inside an f, let's, uh, let's insert an extra label inside this lambda, push f1. And that would give us some useful information. Now we've got main and f1 for our stack. And if we did that, then we get a situation where um, if you add a new binding, so this is just g equals f with an extra push inside, then this has no effect on the stacks. It doesn't change the stacks of the program. 
Uh, but if you were to E to expand that definition, if instead of just G push G on uh, uh, of F, you have lambda X, and then you put the X here, then the G does appear in the stack. So things are looking a little bit strange there. Okay? We just E to expanded something and the behavior has changed. And in fact, when we tried this in GAC, what we found was that definitions like this, where you just have a top level name and it's equal to a composition of functions, doesn't appear in the stack. But if you instead had written hx equals f composed g applied to x, now it does appear in the stack. So this is a little bit surprising and somewhat undesirable because you don't expect that simple um, semantics preserving transformations have such a, a big effect on the information that you get. Furthermore, it gets worse. So if you were to define a state monad, here's a simple state monad. Uh, it's monad m, abstracted over states s, and there's nothing unusual there, except perhaps we have an error operation. So in this case, the error operation is just going to call error inside the monad. And we might like to know where error is called from in our computation. And we have a standard run m operation. So, here's a simple program. If, uh, if it's our main, we get to print the result of run m applied to bar, applied to a list, and here's the initial state. Bar is a function that map ends foo across the list, and foo calls error m. So we would like to see a stack, something like this. Main calls run m, run m called bar, bar called map m, foo, and error m. But in fact, what you see, is something really stupid like just run it, or perhaps even just main. We've lost almost all the information. Why is that? Well, if you imagine expanding out the definitions of the, the monadic combinators, you start off with a, uh, an operation f that does dp followed by q, that expands to this when we expand out the do syntax, and then the bind operation, oh sorry, we, first of all the compiler adds the push that we want to see, and then if you imagine expanding out the bind operation, we would see push f and then lambda s and all this. And we know from the example a few slides ago that if the push is outside the lambda, then it doesn't do anything. It just gets lost. So that's why we see no information at all from this state like that. So, yeah, when we tried this in GXC, uh, we tried to profile the programs that had lots of I.O. in them. And all the costs of the I.O. is just attributed to main, so there's no information at all. So where have we got to? Well, we managed to eliminate lazy evaluation and tail call optimization from, from affecting the stacks. And we got back to the stack that you would get in a strict functional language with no tail call optimization. But it isn't good enough, at least not in Haskell, where we do lots of monads and uh, complicated high order stuff. So We've got to go back to this definition of call and try and find a better one that does something closer to what we want. So the other obvious, obvious choice that you might think of is well, what's call s up, uh, s lamb equals s lamb. That's not a great choice either because it just completely ignores the calling context. It just gives you a, a static lexical call stack that you could have generated from the source code. It doesn't tell you anything about the dynamic execution. So clearly we need to take into account both SR and SLAB. So I'm going to jump straight to the definition that I'm actually using and uh, without going into too much detail about how I got there. So the definition we're actually using is, is this. We look at the, the common prefix of the two stacks and extract that common prefix, so that's called SPRE. And anything that's left over after the common prefix, uh, these two substacks, s at prime and s lamb prime. And the stack we use for a call is the stack of the application plus the extra bit from the lambda that remains after we've deleted the common prefix from the two stacks. So it turns out that this works really nicely with, um, in particular, it eliminates the difference between inlining a function and leaving the function where it was because the common prefix you can think of is the stack, up to the point where the function was defined. Right, and the, the s lamb bit 
is the extra bit inside the definition of the function. Uh, so this, this behaves quite nicely, as far as I can tell. And the other thing that we need to take into account is recursion. So I haven't said anything about recursion so far. What happens if you push a label on the stack and it's already on there? Presumably we don't want to have arbitrary uh, stacks of arbitrary depth. So the, the push definition here just truncates the stack back to the original definition of L, or the original character of L. So this works fairly well. I know of one or two situations where it has some strange behaviour. So that's the, the current status is that I need to resolve the last remaining issues. So this being an implementer's talk, uh, I'm not telling you something that's completely finished, it's in the work in progress paper. The status is that uh, in 741 we've got this behaviour that I've just described. Uh, profiling is using push, and if you use this strange argument to, to your program plus rts dash xc, it will show you the stack at the point where uh, the program raises an exception. And if you try this in previous versions of GXC, you'll know it's completely useless, and now it's much better. Um, something new is that we've got programmatic access to the call stack. So from your program you can call trace stack, which is like trace to print, print out print call stack. And also error with stack trace, which is just like error with the printer and stack trace. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to show you a quick demo, I hope. So I've got some. So this program is the one with the, the state manner that I was showing you earlier, except in the error n function, I'm calling error with stack trace. So that's going to print out the error along with the current stack trace. But that doesn't work with profiling off, right? Right, okay. exactly. So to compile it, I have to say dash f prof, dash f prof, also. Okay. So it prints out the stack that you expect. We've got main, right at the bottom, called run n bar through error n, a lambda inside error n, and finally error with stack trace. So um, that's a good question. So what I'd really like to do is to incorporate this into GHCI. And GHCI already has a system of breakpoints that, uh, that keep track of free variables and other breakpoints. Um, so ideally I'd like to add this stack semantics into GHCI so that your program running in GHCI would automatically get stack traces. And then you would hopefully get function arguments and free variables as well. Yeah. Um, in this section, I'm missing uh, the byte operator. And if it would be there, the truncating, wouldn't it mean that I always lose everything in this deck between the first use of the uh, binder bread or anything else that's used itself and the last one? Yeah, good question. Why did we get the binder operator? Right, so. Um, can you compare what 
this result or this approach versus what other languages with a lot of user uh, end user written closures do. Like uh, JavaScript has the exact same problem where people have lexical the lexical stack versus the call stack. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know a lot about what they're doing. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I would conjecture they don't have this problem with with lambdas. They do. They do. Yeah. And they typically just lose the lexical, the lexical stack entirely, and so the program is just like forging through variables to figure it out. Yeah. But it would be interesting to see if other better languages than JavaScript had solved this problem. Right. So something that I didn't mention but slightly related to that is that there are essentially two approaches you could take. You could take the approach that says, we're just going to give you what's on the execution stack anyway, even though we know it's a bit bogus, and, uh, but hopefully there's some information there. Um, the advantage of that is that you don't have to compile your entire program for profiling. You could do what Peter Warren was describing earlier on and have a mapping from object code to source code. Um, but that's not so good for profiling. So what I'm trying to do here is something that's good for profiling and debugging at the same time, but, no, but still has some runtime overhead. That's the trade-off. I have just a quick add-on question to Thomas's question. So Thomas asked about um, printing out some values in, in the stack, trace. Uh, is that and I guess I have the same question for other error messages, uh, such as when you have a dash case error. So that's a scenario where the get line of this, which is great, so we don't even need a stack trace necessarily. Um, well, it helps. But uh, is, is it difficult? Would it be difficult for the compiler to find out if there's a show instance for the thing that wasn't matched, or if there are any case values here, and just use that show instance? That's something that would be much easier in GXCI. Okay. You can't really do it very easily in a compiler program. So, my name is JC Knight. A couple of days ago, we had uh, a paper. Uh, using Haskell to uh, express a machine learning algorithm. In the paper, they say that uh, using GCI to debugging and uh, profiling was unfeasible because of the wrong computation. I mean, we can survive, I'm just saying. Right. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, profiling does add some work here. And that, as I was saying, that's the trade off. Yeah. Uh, right, um, so I was wondering, how much does this affect performance? It's about a factor of two. Okay. okay a follow-up question I was going to have is, uh, is there a way of getting even just the lexical call stack uh, for free uh, and, and providing more or less the same user interface? So what Peter was describing earlier on, gives you essentially the lexical call stack. It tells you which function you're in. Um, but it won't give you any stack information other than you, know, you could look through the, the execution stack and get, uh, get your strange lazy evaluation on no tail calls and so on. That might be better than nothing. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm just thinking for production code. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions? Anyone? I missed. Speak now or for the older piece. Okay, so it's lunchtime. Uh, the session was